All right, fellas, we've all experienced those awkward moments when people are using their smartphones at very inopportune times. And I mean, like in the grocery store bathroom. Or sometimes we see people like thumbing out a text message at church or at family dinner. Matt or Joe, are either of you uh, guilty of these infractions by chance? My wife is. <laughs> Snap. Of course, I think I think I think everybody's uh, I think everybody's guilty. Uh, but but in our family, there's like certain periods and times. Like, hey, are we at the dinner table? Like, phone away. I I think church, like you said, is another big one. But like maybe the unique one for my family is like if we all get together, which we do pizza movie night on Friday nights, and we cook homemade pizzas, and it's like, hey, we're all gonna put our conscious awareness into this movie, and thou shall not be sidetracked by your phone. Right. Same, same at your house, Joe. Yeah. You know, during like dinner time, it's, it's phones don't come out. Um, my, my middle one who is 16 is, is okay at it, but my oldest is great at any given time. She's going to be walking around on it, but when she's present with her friends, when she's present in in a moment she shuts everything down and does a great job of doing that um for me 86 percent of what i do on my phone is read so you know it's not like i'm scrolling through you know any mm -hmm. any vines or anything it's literally just me reading books so sometimes yeah, Dad, you're you on catch, your phone you're on your phone why can't yeah. i be on mine i am yeah. reading i'm, wor I'm working i'm working different rules for you well yeah. get this you guys there there was um a major phone infraction and i'm talking like big time because there was an oklahoma judge who was caught on camera sending texts and i'm not talking like one or two but like hundreds of texts to her bailiff during a murder trial uh, yeah, she was sitting on uh, overseeing a trial uh, of a kid, a two-year-old kid who was murdered, and she was busy texting about the prosecutors, the defending attorneys, and some very explicit awesome. texts. Yeah, terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say like on a scale of uh, target bathroom texting versus like- uh, Murder trial texting. Murder trial. Yeah, this was pretty bad. So naturally- she was found guilty and uh, resigned her position. And she vowed to never seek judicial office in Oklahoma ever again. But I don't know, guys. Um, I feel like she should not seek office anywhere. Yeah, she's think? probably in like Montana doing the same thing, or 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 maybe not. You know what? Maybe she learned her lesson. Is like, okay, that was embarrassing, and and tries to be better. I'll, I'll give her, I'll give her some credit there. But I will say, there's an argument there for a mistrial. You can't do stuff like that. Truth. All right, guys, let's get started. This is the Tango Alpha Lima Podcast. They call me crazy because I'm facing all my giants. They try to scare me into thinking I can't fight it. They tell me I should never even think of trying. But that's just me. I'm going to live out in defiance. Welcome, Alphas. Thanks for joining us. We have a great show for you today. Today, our guest will be retired Navy SEAL Commander Rich Davidi. During his 20-plus year career, he helped SEALs perform faster, longer, and better, especially in high-stress environments. After he retired, he used some of the same tools to develop the attributes method and now works as a speaker, facilitator, and consultant to train businesses, athletics, and military leaders. And since he's a SEAL, there is, of course, a book. Naturally. We'll talk about that in just a bit. But first, Joe has a question for us to answer. So in this week's Ask Us Anything, we have a question from Scott Hardman that was posed on a social media post. Do you have any good VSOs? I'm looking for one in Gilbert, Arizona. So you can, find, you can find accredited American Legion service officers near you by using our service officer locator tool at legion.org backslash service officer. So, and, and they help all veterans. And I, I mentioned this, uh, you know, previously, uh, but, you know, they, you don't have to necessarily be a member of the American Legion, but wouldn't it be great to support something that, that does reach out and help veterans free of charge like this, but you, you can find help through the American Legion without being a member. 
You know, um, some, now that we're on this topic, Joe, because there's nothing more infuriating to me than to see um, law offices, like, um, basically preying on veterans who are struggling to get their claims passed through or appeals and stuff like that, because they take them, they take some of the veterans money. I'm not saying all attorneys do, but the the lion's share that you're going to see ads for are going to take some of your money. And, um, I don't understand why they do that, but as a caution to all those alphas out there, or if you have a loved one who's a veteran who's struggling, please seek out a VSO from the American Legion before you dial uh, an attorney's number. Um, there are services There's out no there. There's no downside. It's yeah. free. You know, and, and a lot of times, you know, you'll see law laws, lawyers that will use, we're going to win and we guarantee. So all we'll ask is 10% of the, you know, 18 months of back pay that you've been trying to re, you know, receive and they get paid triple what they would have gotten paid for literally sending in paperwork that you could, you could do with the help of a service officer through the American Legion. Yep. Okay. So don't fall prey. Okay. I was going <laughs> to say, yeah. So don't fall prey to these predatory law fir firms who overcharge for the services that you can get for free. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alvis, please stick around. We'll be right back with our friend, Rich Davini right after the break. Attention veterans, when it comes to Medicare Advantage, WellCare and the American Legion think you deserve more. Call today to find out about the WellCare Medicare Advantage plans that give you more benefits alongside your VA benefits. Visit WellCareForVeterans.com today. That's WellCareForVeterans.com or call 844-917-1165. Ohio Health Plan, a plan offered by WellCare Health Insurance of Arizona, Inc. New Mexico dual eligible special needs plan DSNP members. As a well care by all well DSNP member, you have coverage from both Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid services are funded in part by the state of New Mexico. New Mexico Medicaid benefits may be limited to payment of Medicare premiums for some members. Welcome back, Alphas. Today, our guest is retired Navy SEAL Commander Rich Diveny. Rich, welcome to the Tango Alpha Lima podcast. Thank you, Stacey. It's great to be here. Man, what a, what a treat. Adam, yeah, you going to kick us off? Yeah, for sure, Rich. It's a, it's an absolute pleasure to to have you here, brother. We're excited to to talk with you today to to learn more about your book, The Attributes: Twenty Five Hidden Drivers of Optimal Performance. Uh, but before that, you were a Navy SEAL commander for twenty years. Can you tell us a little bit about the attributes for you personally that drove you to become a Navy SEAL, and what was it inside you that enabled you to do one of the hardest things on the planet? And, wow, that's uh, a, yeah. Yeah, and how do those attributes serve you during that time frame? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. It's it's, it's probably very detailed. I would say um so I was a, yeah, I was a Navy SEAL officer. I was only a commander for the last couple of years, right? But you know that, you know, I started as an ensign and, and worked my way up, but um uh but you know, attributes so so the attributes for a Navy SEAL, I think um you know, if we could figure out the exact set, I think then SEAL training would be able to have a much less uh, uh, but much less high attrition rate. Um, but it's it's hard to figure that out. I do know though that there are at least one or two, and specifically one, um, that's that's absolutely essential in making it through SEAL training. That's uh, that's a really high level of compartmentalization. Um, and that's you know that's really the ability to, um, in, inside of an environment, prioritize what you want to focus on, focus on that, and block out everything else. And and I say that because you know you go through that type of training. Um, and it's so intense that if you think about anything farther than you need to, you will you'll quit. You'll get overwhelmed. And and you know and and for those who are in the audience, I'm sure many people are familiar with seals. It's amazing. I, I joined the seals in 1996, and very few people knew what seals were back then. And now everybody does. I mean, I go I go around the world, and people know. So, um, but uh, but it you know the seal training is buds, basic underwater demolition training, and and. And six months long, and there's three phases. But the first phase is kind of that kind of kick your butt phase, see how many people quit. And you have Hell Week during that first phase. And Hell Week is um, it's the fifth week of training. You start on a Sunday afternoon, and then you go until the following Friday. And you only sleep for about two and a half hours for that entire week. And you're you're cold, you're wet, you're sandy, you're running around with boats on your head and 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 big telephone poles and things. I mean, it's, it's miserable. You get most people quitting during that week, and. And the saying is that if you think about Friday of Hell Week on Monday, you will quit, you know. And so and so that's kind of a it's a it's a quick way to say that those folks who show up and they don't have a 
a high level of the ability to compartmentalize um, are not going to make it. And then it just gets hyper developed in trading. And then, of course, you it's absolutely essential in combat, too. So so if there was if there is one that I think is the most important, it would be that one. And 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 where where I got that, it's it's difficult to say. I think that's something I you know, we all we all compartmentalize to a degree. Um some of us do it through trauma that we, we we grow up and we have trauma that we we, we do it I, I had a very nice childhood i didn't have any trauma so but one of the things i did recognize is that um when i was a kid my dad always liked to uh uh heat our house with uh, with our wood fireplace and so he used to buy cords of wood and have them dumped in the driveway and our job was to move the wood my brother and i had to move the wood up to the front of the house and stack it and and there's two ways you could do it you could do it the, the, the short way but that involved going upstairs which meant you could only do it handful by handful right or you could go the long way which involved going up a hill and going around the house but you could put it in wheelbarrows and so of course we chose the wheelbarrow barrel route because you just you get more done um you know at, at one time and i remember those piles of wood we never looked at the whole pile of wood we just focused on one wheelbarrow at a time and 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 just trudged and trudged and trudged until finally it was gone so i think that in in at least a small way probably was was compartmentalizing practice uh so so that's how i'll answer that because i think all the other ones we could we could talk for at least a, a few days on <laughs> what we think seals attributes are i think stacy uses that same she uh, runs a horse farm she probably does everything a wheelbarrow at a time when she's cleaning the stalls out those big draft oh, horses yeah. oh yeah one horse nugget at a time that's, all you can do. <laughs> that's right yeah that's right all right. So um, I, I got a question. And, and so, you know, I signed up for your, you know, the website. I, I love it. I love, I, I am very introspective. I spent a year and a half in the hospital after I got hurt in Iraq in 2004. I've got a shiny metal leg on one side and that's my good leg. Oh, wow. So um, I, I, first of all, who added the kid dancing on the email verification screen? Because I like that. Yeah. That made I made me I really say, happy. He's like, yeah. he's asleep. Then he's just like, <laughs> I, I think it was my I think it was my tech guy, so I have to I have to credit him for that. It was not my idea. So, and and so I one thing that you said that really jumped out at me there is skills are awesome when things go as planned. When things don't go as planned, that's when attributes kick in. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's really funny. So when I got blown up, I was able to put my own tourniquet on and all that. And it, and and a lot of that was training, but that stuff doesn't work if you don't have what it takes to utilize that in a moment. So I've got. Two questions. One, how did you align on those 25 attributes from your time in service, number one? And then number two, what I, I, I'm curious in the data of what order people take your test in. Because I feel like that's relevant data. You know, uh, how many people click on leadership because they think they're leaders? How many people click on grit because they think they've got grit? Yeah. I'm, I'm curious if people self identify as one thing compared to their results. Yeah, yeah. Um, the um, so so f I'll do the second question first before I get into the kind of that twenty five and how I came across the twenty five. Um, we we don't have we don't have like true blue, uh, you know, kind of nitnoid data. However, it it when we first put it out, people were most interested in the grit category. Um, now, admittedly, when we first put it out, it was only grit, mental acuity, and and drive. Right. So we didn't have the leadership and team ability because we were. I was kind of thinking through how we wanted to to do that. Um, but yeah, most people seem to be interested in, okay, how gritty am I? Um, and that makes sense. I mean, those, you think about those grit attributes are, you know, courage, perseverance, adaptability, resilience. A lot of us feel like those are kind of elemental to the human experience. Although I would argue that the mental acuity ones come before, uh, any of them, <laughs> but, um, but I think that's been the most, um, the most popular so far, um, in terms of, in terms of, um, the, the 25 attributes in the book, you know, I, when I did this at, you know, I was part of, I was part of um, a very specialized SEAL command. I don't necessarily talk about it in public, but, you know, but, you know, development group, uh, you know, was where I was, where I was at. And, and, and I ran the selection there and the, the whole impetus was, of this was to try to figure out what was causing guys to succeed or fail. And, and in that process came up with about 36 attributes uh, that we were looking for in these, in the particular operators and in, in, in us really in, in terms of this command. Um, and so I used that as my initial baseline for the book. I said, oh, let me look at the 36. And admittedly, when I did it back in, in 2010, my, my knowledge on attributes wasn't as nuanced. And so I, I recognized that I had in that 36, there were some skills that were in there, you know, it was a mix. It wasn't as, 
as de de definite, but um, but but I was able to call it down into the 25 because it just made sense. And I really began to ask myself, what are these elemental things? Um, and then I kind of focused on optimal performance, this idea that, you know, how can we do the best we can in the moment, whatever the best looks like in the moment? That's what optimal performance is. It's not peak performance. You don't peak all the time, right? How can I do the best? And so, so it binned quite nicely into these five categories, these 25 attributes. And then admittedly, as the, after the book came out, we began working with people and organizations. Um, it began to dawn on us and me that, okay, well, I never thought there was just 25 anyway, but it began to become apparent what some other ones were. And so now we're up yeah. to 42, as you know, nine categories. And, 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 and I, I keep on looking, I mean, if I find other ones, I, I'm going to add them, but, but I, I feel pretty comfortable with the, for, the list of 42. It seems like it covers most stuff. Um, and, um, and so that's how it's evolved, but the, but I would say I'm still very comfortable with those 25 being focused on kind of the, the real elemental ones one needs for optimal performance i think that i i still feel comfortable with that as a as a slight side question here do do you feel like you can sorry because you know sometimes you meet people and they've got it whatever it is it's, yeah. it's you know i i like to call it moxie because no one uses the word anyway yeah i love it yeah so, <laughs> so like you know when you how do you feel like you as somebody who looks inward like this so often are good at catching those, those people with Moxie? Like, do you, can you catch somebody pretty quick and say, if their body doesn't break, their mind will push them through this? Yeah. They, well, the answer is um, yes. If I see them in, in experience, right. Um, you see this the most visibly and viscerally in challenge, stress and uncertainty. And so, uh, so when I see, when, if I can see, and I saw it when I was running this training to everything about SEAL training, whether it's basic training or, 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 or the, the training I was running is about throwing guys into stress, challenge, and uncertainty. So, so I got pretty good at um, in those specific situations, environments, being able to say, okay, well, here's what I'm seeing, and I, of course have matured that that um, that knowledge as I've gone. But I, I have to say, I mean, the, the you know the the context inside of which you see this stuff, the context of stress, challenge, and uncertainty is in fact subjective. You know, some of us, you know, I I always joke, you know, I I always hated heights, which meant I did not like skydiving. Right? I love flying. Everything about flying I love, but but jumping out of an airplane was always scary to me. I didn't like it. Right? Meanwhile, you could put me in pitch black water, with zero visibility, with sea life teeming around me, and I would fall asleep. You know, and so as he stays, he's you know she's there are some, and so you know so so this 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 where these attributes begin to show up in this stress challenge and journey is subjective to the environment. So. Um, so yeah, the answer is yes, I can in certain, in, in, in certain environments, but, um, but, and I love the word moxie because I think moxie actually can apply to almost all of the attributes in some way, right? And moxie yeah. defined for one group could be different, something different than moxie defined for another group. So I actually, as, as, as I love the word cause it's old and I love the word cause it's actually quite ubiquitous. I, 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 the word moxie too. <laughs> I, I like, it's like a mix of character and, um, charisma. I guess yeah. in a way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. it's also a state of mind too. Yeah. So, um, so somebody going through uh seal training, the the stress and the, and the challenges that they face and being able to kind of cultivate these attributes in this program, but then uh, apply it to uh, like um training athletes or the the corporate environment cuz obviously the the mission's, you know, a little bit different and yeah. what what their fit for function is going to be in in dev grew uh, is going to be different than in the corporate boardroom. So how do you um, like take those elements and bring them over there, even though they're completely different mission sets? Well, so so the cool thing about attributes is is and the reason why I've loved writing about them and talking about them is because they're very elemental in terms of human behavior and human performance. And 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 what I always wanted to do. I mean, there's enough seal books out there. There's you know, God knows, and I know and a lot of them are good. I know I'm not I'm not bashing on my buddies. A lot of my a lot of my buddies are the ones who write them, right? So. But I didn't want to write another seal book. I wanted to write a book about mm. the person who was reading the book, right? And so, um, and and one of my one of my goals in that was to immediately try to take the seals off the pedestal and make sure we humanize everything. And the attributes humanize everybody uh, because we all have them. And and you know, all of us can agree we've all been in in diverse professions, and we can agree that we are all rock stars in certain domains and and doofuses in other domains, right? So, and regardless of who you are. Um, so all that to say, um, what, what we do now and what the process we're able to do with, with different organizations and teams is help them understand what attribute list is 
required for the context of their team. The attribute list for a group of SEALs is going to look different than the attribute list for a group of athletes mm -hmm. or boardroom members or, or, or salespeople, right? So, so we, we help people figure that out first, and then they can start understanding, okay, how can their own unique attribute set um, kind of seed into that? Um, and then, of course, you have to understand, I mean, you know, the attributes for involved, you know, athletics is, is often a, um, uh, a, 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 a compare, a, a comparable, um, environment or venue for for soldiers um, but in fact um when we really look at it it's it's actually not as comparable as you think because because i will tell you athleticism has very little to do with being a navy seal i was an, i was i was a i played sports but i was never quote an athlete i was okay at sports right so athleticism involves this kind of dexterity and, and hand-eye coordination things like that it's really about these attributes it's about you know tough being tough enough and having the qualities to push through right? The other thing about athletics is athletics often doesn't involve the same levels of uncertainty um, that uh, that that the the military profession does, or, or or even some other professions. I'm not saying now. I'm not saying any of this um, to bust on athletics. I think athletics come with their own specific set of attributes, and and the difference between a a Drew Brees and a Tom Brady versus the the quarterback who can throw the ball as far as those two guys um, is in fact attributes, right? So. Um, uh, so, but long story, kind of long, long, long winded answers to say that, that every group has its own unique set. And what we'll do is we'll help groups figure out that set so they can then begin to measure and, and examine their performance, um, alongside that. Rich. Yeah. I, I actually like Joe, I took the test, um, yeah. which had some very, um, opening results. I'm not going to get into all the numbers and, and stuff like that. But um, as I was taking the test, the thought occurred to me, if you're a dishonest person, you're going to answer dishonestly um, and get a and get a not so helpful uh, response out of, out of the scores. Mm -hmm. I answered as truthfully as possible. And it still surprised me very much. Um, one of them, all the high points, I already kind of knew that about myself. Yeah. But what, what I scored low in was um, persistence, narcissism, insouciance, and competitiveness. Okay. And um, I thought to myself, I don't know if I necessarily want to score high as a narcissist. Right. Uh, and but what what really caught me off guard was the fact that I scored low in competitiveness. Um, yeah. I've always, you know, if you're if you're doing anything good in your life, you're you're probably going to be competing against one person or another. So I guess I'm aware of that, but. After taking the test, some of the questions were like, do you uh, get more satisfaction out of others winning over you? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Especially if I'm their mentor or if I'm their boss, when they win, I win. So I don't know if that dropped me down on the competitive. Like, how does that work? What I'm glad I'm glad you asked that, Stacey, because because this is a this is one that people often have a little bit of trouble with. Um, and when I was looking at competitiveness as an attribute, what I had to do is I and a lot of when you. When, so actually, first, let me say the uh, the dishonest person is also not honest about their own introspection anyway. So I'm not concerned about what, <laughs> what results they get. Yeah. It's going to be it's not going to be accurate. So um, but um, I will say in the in the um, in the act of writing the book, um, there was a lot of introspection that I did on myself. And, and one of those was with this competitive attribute. And, and the reason was because when I looked at competitiveness and, and obviously competitiveness as an attribute, high is high competitiveness and low is non-competitive. Right. I have never, ever been a competitive person. And what does that mean? It means that even when I played mm. sports, I was the captain of my lacrosse team in high school. And whenever we won or lost, it didn't emotionally affect me that much, right? In fact, I would sometimes fake being upset because I didn't want to look weird in front of my teammates. And, and I actually thought this would be a detriment when I began to look at SEALs. I was like, well, man, it seems like a really competitive environment. Do I need to is this going to be a problem? And as soon as I hit the beaches of SEAL training, I, I began to understand that it was not going to be an issue. And the, spe the reason is because most high-performing teams honor both polarities. And the reason why is because mm -hmm. the polarities are different, right? The competitive mind, the high competitive mind, first of all, competition always implies winning and losing. That's what it implies, right? So to win and lose anything requires rules, boundaries, and constrictions that define winning or losing, right? That's the only way you can you can actually win or lose. You have to define what winning or losing means. So the competitive mind will enter into environments. I'm talking about high competitiveness, right? And always, almost always look for what are those rules and those things that allow me to define winning and losing, okay? 
Um, now, what the competitive, what the high competitive mind will also do is if they walk into an environment and there really are no visible rules, they'll make stuff up. <laughs> you know, this is like the this is like the, uh, the 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 punch in the stomach contest, right? Well, you know, how do you win a punch in the stomach? You have to make up rules to 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 to, to win that, right? So, um, so that and and this that type of mentality can be extremely useful in certain environments, right? Obviously, athletics. There are certain business environments. There are certain uh, environments that in anything that involves finite game type stuff, competitiveness actually uh, works. The non-competitive mind typically walks into environments and says there are no rules, right? And I'm not concerned about what this person or that person is doing. I'm concerned. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna figure it out, right? This actually is very advantageous for special operations, especially because while there are some missions that are fairly straightforward, you know, we're gonna run up the line on this one, and it's it's not really. It's kind of black and white. Most special operations is about how can we win? How can we? How can we succeed? Or do what we need to do, and and we're not following any rules at all. And so, so the non-competitive mind will go into environments and begin to work around stuff. And there's no real concern um, with with pitting oneself up against another, right? And so, so a great example for me, right? I, I came out of the Navy, and I was I was immediately in the leadership space. I, you know, my buddy is Simon Sinek, and he and I were working together. Um, and um, and so I was in this leadership space. And as I began to figure out that I wanted to kind of do my own thing. Obviously, a lot of people are like, well, you have so much to talk about when it comes to leadership. And I said, I, I have no interest in being in that space. There's a bunch of people who are already in that space. They're doing a great job. I don't mm -hmm. need to, comp I have no interest in competing. What I want to do is I want to go over here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the performance space. And so, so I would say to you, first of all, whenever we get a low score, um, it's, a, it's a guidepost, right? It's really just a snapshot. And the idea is introspect on it and say, okay, when I think about in environments where um, where I'm where that that attributes being expressed, does this make sense to me? So, in other words, are you someone who, when you are in an environment, do you typically say, "Okay, I'm going to figure out. I want to. I want to win. I want to like do this. I really want to mm -hmm. win. That really drives me." Or you're like, you know what? I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not as concerned about winning. I like the fact that when all of us come up, that's good. Or or I like to do my own thing. And I think that's how we start describing that. So. So with that, does that help make a little bit more sense of the low score for you? <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, I... yeah. And you know, I think I can apply this to even as something as recreational as playing dominoes with my husband who feels like he has to win or he's, you know, goes he's having an, an anxiety attack where I'm like, I'm just in the moment having fun with you. That's what the there point you go. is. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, now, no, I will makes... say this, Stacey, it doesn't mean that people like you and I are not competitive once in a while. We are. I mean, there are certain things that we do, but we just it just doesn't, our minds don't drive that way automatically mm -hmm. we don't default mm -hmm. to that stuff right so uh so that's that's what that means or, or maybe it's so, internal uh, you know a lot of times for me uh especially and i and i i know i'm a little atypical in that because of my experiences because of my injury i'm just blatantly aware of things i can and cannot do so when i do a gym competition or something like that and there's a portion where i have to like pull a sled i'm not going to do well but I'm going to do it because it's part of the competition and there will be people that don't even try. And I will beat every one of those people who don't try. Right. Right. And, but the, in the competitive nature of that sense, I do enjoy winning, but I want to beat you by helping you be your very best and beating you anyway, or losing to you and learning something about myself that, Hey, I just don't have what rich has in this, Yeah, but maybe I can get there. You know, well, and so Joe, I think where, some, where did you follow the competitive score? Where, where where did you fall on it? My my competitive was low as well. Let's see yeah. here. Um, it sound, just 3. the way you just, five. Yeah, just the way you talked sounds like you're just like Stacy and I. And the reason is because yes, you you're there's competition. So I don't I don't count when we people say, "What about competing against myself?" I don't think we compete against ourselves because again, yeah. competition implies winning and losing. I'm not going to beat myself, right? <laughs> no, that's not. I mean, what 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 that is is it's perseverance, it's drive, it's all these other attributes that allow us to push ourselves beyond our previous limits. But it sounds to me like you are someone in this category that like says, you know what? I, I'm not as concerned about beating people. I, when it when I do, sometimes it feels good. Sometimes it doesn't, yeah. depending on who I beat. But I love when people are brought up around me. I love even contributing to someone who actually wins because of my contribution. So it sounds like your score is, is spot on. And again, the idea is you look at this stuff and you say to myself, you say, you say to yourself, neither one is bad, right? It's just, okay, how does, how does this polarity affect my current niche, my current environment? Is it, is it advantageous to what I'm doing? Is it disadvantageous? Um, and depending on those answers, do I need to work on it or don't I?
But can you can you maybe expand on that a little bit? Because, you know, for example, I was a, a management consultant for five years after getting out of the military and we took the Clifton Strengths Finder yeah. as as part of kind of onboarding. So what we were coached to do was, you know, really look at like your top five or your top ten. Yeah. And 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 then if you're gonna put any effort into anything, like work on those because yeah. you're already strongest. You know, you've already developed and uh, you know your subconscious programming's already been programmed, you know, to a to a degree. So you're going to move the needle more by focusing on your your top five as opposed to, you know, which was kind of contrary to what I thought at the time, which is like, oh, I'm weak in these things. Well, I need I need to bring these up. And it's like, no, like the way that you're wired, you're going to have to put so much effort to move the needles in those. So how do you apply? You've already kind of touched on it a little bit with the, with the attributes. And, and I think what I'm hearing is that it depends on the environment that you're in. And what is your your need in the way yeah. that you're selecting these specific attributes for whether it's corporate or athletics uh, or the SEALs, because not all apply to everybody the same way. It's not also only focused on your top. It's how can you blend them together with your team so that not everybody even has to be strong in everything? How can you be complementary? One hundred percent. And I, I say I think everything's about environment because that's what we we live in. I mean, our behavior mm -hmm. and our performance is all about the environment. So and so the way I kind of describe this um, is that I like to think of all of us as automobiles. Right. We're all we're all cars. Right. But we're all different types of cars. Some of us are Jeeps. Some of us are SUVs. Some of us are Ferraris. And there's no judgment because the Jeep can do things the Ferrari can't do and the Ferrari can do things the Jeep can't do. Right. But unless we lift our hood and start figuring out what specifics we have, we don't know what car we are. And and I think in a so the strengths finder philosophy, I think, is is both right and wrong. So in other words, um, mm -hmm. if I lift the hood and I realize that I'm a Jeep and I've been trying to run on a Ferrari track this whole time, suddenly my my misery becomes real. <laughs> I, I say, OK, well, now I know why I've been miserable. And then it's a choice for me to, to say, OK, do I want to try to be a Jeep that's running on this Ferrari? Do I want to try to be turned into a Ferrari? That is going to be very, very difficult. Or do I say, you know, wait a second, you know, I'm just going to change my track. You know, more often what happens is we're in environments that we're, we're, we're reasonably good at and we're reasonably happy in. And what happens is we say, you know what, my top attributes seem to fill out my uh, the, the explanation of why I'm succeeding here. Uh, my bottom attributes in some cases also do the same. Like, so, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm also, it's, it's also a kind of a, a truism that just because you're low on an attribute doesn't mean you have to improve it, you know? And in fact, improving a, a particular attribute may be detrimental to what you're trying to do. I always kind of use the stand-up comic. The stand-up comic who has too much empathy might not be a very good stand-up comic, right? Because how can you find funny at a funeral if you have too much empathy? So, so the stand-up comic may not choose to work on one's empathy, but what sometimes happens and often does is, you, is there's there, there might be one or two low ones or ones that you're low on. They say, you know what? Actually, if I want to do better in the niche I'm in, it would behoove me to work on this, right? And then you say, okay, well, now I only need to work on maybe one, you know, uh, and it might not even be one you're low on. It might be one that you're medium low on, right? Because those medium lows and those medium highs also start to speak. So so I think, um, I think uh, capitalize your strengths by understanding what niche you're in and find the right environment so that you're capitalizing on your attributes because that's gonna to speak to your performance. And then inside of that say, okay, what might be the one or two ones that by, by, by proactively working on, I could actually do better in this current niche. And I, that's how I'd explain it. Mm. And I think also like knowing your weaknesses as well. Like it, I think it's so important that even if you can't fix everything about yourself because you know, we're, we're 40 plus and, and trying to find a way to, to fix a, you know, an attribute is not something that's going to be for everyone, but being aware of it and knowing your weaknesses, you know, if you, if you know, there's a stretch of highway that you like to run a little fast on and there's cops there a lot, you know, it doesn't fix the fact that you like to drive fast, but it yeah. does help to be aware. This is a bad time. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, and Joe, I think this is a great point. And this is where, this is where teaming comes in. Right. Um, and to, to create a high performing team, the highest performing teams are, vulnerable with each other. And what I mean by vulnerability, it's not the it's not the stigmatized version that we always hear that's like showing your weaknesses. We all know this because we all serve, right? Um, in the best teams, um, vulnerability means I'm going to wear my strengths and my weaknesses on my sleeve so that my teammates know exactly where I can lean on them and where they can lean on me, right? And this is where you start saying, okay, just because I'm low on an attribute doesn't mean I have to develop it because my teammate over here 
has got my back, right? I always use my wife and I as an example. We've been married 24 years. Um, nice. We consider ourselves a high performing team, right? We lived through a war. We have two kids who are teenagers now. And now I am someone who is high on patience, okay? Uh, my wife is someone who's low on patience. She is impatient, okay? That has worked beautifully in our marriage of 24 years because when patience has been required, I step up. Right. And when impatience is required, she steps up. If we had a if we had a team of all patient people, you're going to you're probably have a team that procrastinates a little bit too much or doesn't make a decision. Right. Or waits too long. If you have a team of all impatient people, you're going to have a team that's just too impulsive. You know, so so her impulsivity has helped take down my patience a little bit. And my patience has helped take down her impulsivity a little bit. And so so this is where you begin to mesh this mesh that stuff and things like again competitiveness and non-competitiveness, those mesh together together very you see most high performing teams have both polarities. Patience and patience is the same one. Um uh and then there's a couple other ones that that uh that you, you, when you have both it just it's very effective. Yeah. You know so it's are, funny are you, you bring Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ben. No. Well, I was just going to ask if 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 like when you work with people, do you work with them on the individual level or do you only work with them if they're willing to come together, you know, as a team, because I hear so much, it's about the individual, but really what you're trying to unlock is, you know, greater performance of the team to be able to accomplish yeah. something much greater than what individual could. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily do individual coaching. Uh, uh, the attributes assessment helps someone. So what we, what we're, our whole thing, our niche is high performing teams, right? And how do you, how do you get a team that's extremely high performing? Now to do that, you must have each individual look at themselves and start to really articulate what they bring to that. So it's it's a little bit of both that happens. Uh, so, but most of the work we do is teams. Now we we've we're starting to refine our stuff on I mean, this new assessment, uh, which we're beefing up even more. So we're hoping in the next couple of months it'll be you'll get now it'll be a paid version, but you'll get like a 15 page report on all of your tops, bottoms, and all that stuff. We really want to beef it up so people actually get more than just a score. They get explanation. How do I develop it? All that stuff, right? Those types of things we're trying to do, and we've been evolving over the over the last couple of years, so that we can do better with the individual assessments. Um, a lot of our a lot of our focus has been kind of the the team, the organization stuff. Um, so we're working on that to to help the individual just get a better sense of who they are. But everything about teaming starts first with your individual mm -hmm. self and, and and what you bring. Do you have any specific use cases uh, or or teams or, or clients that you've taken through this process and kind of like where they were operating before and then once going through this and, and getting a chance to to work with you, some of the, the, the things that you see from a practical sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, many and mo most most common case is we go into a team organization and we help them, A, understand their attributes, right? And what that does is gives them that list. Then they can start evaluating their performance internal to their team. So in other words, that might that might um, uh, reveal that, oh, wait a second, this person who was performing at a low level, it wasn't because they're not good at what they do or they're not, they're not good people. It's because they're in the wrong position and it's not the position they're in right now is not is not uh, is not congruent with their their optimal attribute set, right? So so that's one. And then especially it helps because we help them with their hiring and selection processes. So once you know this stuff, now you know what to go out and look for. And you're, instead of hiring people for just raw skill, the stuff they write on the resume, you're saying, wait a second, no, I need someone who is adaptable, um, humble, open-minded, and I'm going to go and specifically look when I do my hiring processes for those attributes. And we've had a lot of success with hiring, with, with organizations bringing, bringing up their retention rate considerably, right? Where, where some, in some cases they were 50% people, 50% of the hires would leave within a year. And now they're up to only 10% of the hires leave because they're, they're just finding a culture fit right off the bat. I, uh, I, I wanted to ask, cause you know, you mentioned your wife, you mentioned, you know, team and, and the why you know, the family is a, is a team, but, uh, I, I heard you say in an interview you know, talking about fear, how subjective that fear is. And we touched on that earlier as well. So, you know, I'm very patient and I'm, I'm, my emotions are pretty immovable unless I feel like if you were to say something that hurt my feelings, it would hurt my feelings more that you tried to hurt my feelings mm, than yeah. what you actually said. So my wife hates that I reframe my, my irritations and my fears into context that way, because it, on the outside, it looks like I have no stressors. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm always in like a re, like a restructuring mindset. So I, my question is is we we reframe I think more naturally compliments. If I were to tell you, man, you've really taken great care of yourself. You know, you're 
your hair looks great. Your style's amazing. Must be going to the gym a lot. Like at a certain point, you start to get more uncomfortable. And then we reframe that in our mind that, well, they just don't know me well enough. I'm lazy. I've been laying around for the last month, not doing anything. Why do we so naturally reframe compliments and good things instead of our stressors in a way that, because I mean, it makes sense that when you're afraid of something to say, you know, I've been shot at, I've been blown up. I've been, I was in Fallujah, like compared to that, this moment of getting in front of a thousand people and speaking is, is not, it has no stakes. I could go yeah. up there and do almost anything. Why, why do you think we do that? Well, so, so again, you, you have had an advantage that many people have not, and that is you've been, you've been placed into or volunteered to be placed into uh, some very extreme environments that have given you context. And so, so for you, it's easy to provide context and you can say, well, I mean, I remember when I first started speaking, for example, you know, I did not like it. I had to get used to, I had, you know, the, the, the normal fears of public speaking were, were, were the same way, but I got over it because I kept on doing it. But I remember in in kind of this fear uh, subject, uh, I was about to go on a uh, go in front of a uh, an audience. The crowd was, I think, a thousand people or so. And um and the uh, organizer and I were backstage, and the organizer said, um, "Are you nervous? You know, or do do you get nerves, or you or you, do you get fear at all?" And I said, "Well, uh, let me ask you a question." And he said, "What?" I was like, "Is anybody in the crowd going to be shooting at me?" And he was like, "No." And I was like, "Well, then I got nothing to worry about." <laughs> you know, I mean, and and I think this type of reframing is something that we. Can do what what reframing does in 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 your case and all of our cases that are able to do it and this is a, this is in fact a skill you can actually develop you just have to really work on it um, is it allows you to actually bring down your autonomic arousal because what happens when we get autonomically aroused is our frontal lobe begins to take a back seat to our limbic brain this is when we we and and the again the 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 end state of this is autonomic overload or amygdala hijack where our limbic is to totally taken over and we're we're acting without thinking. Um, now, the, the, what what fo folks like us have trained to do, uh, and and in some cases been in environments that have uh, have hyper developed this, is we understand that that acting without thinking is not a good is not a good thing. So so the way we interrogate our brain is in fact deliberately bringing our frontal lobe back online. When we ask ourselves a question, because our our limbic brain doesn't have a capacity for language, it's just emotion, right? Anytime we're going through a conscious thinking process, our frontal lobe is coming back online. That is quite literally bringing our autonomic arousal down. It's de-stressing us. Okay. So, so this is a technique that a lot of us, uh, if we've trained to do it, or if we've been in situations we can do, uh, some people just can't do that there. some people's rheostat goes up way high, really fast. And, and it's harder for them to, to reframe in terms of the negative reframing. I'm not sure. I think it's, um, you know, I think again, you know, there's, there's, I think all of us, all of us have some level of, of a sniffer test in terms of, I mean, there's, there's a difference between, Hey man, you look great. And hey, man, you look great. You lost weight. You, your hair looks great. And, and you're like, okay, that's a little bit, you know, it feels like they're doing a little bit too much there, right? What do you I, want? You know, <laughs> yeah, so, so I think, I, and again, I don't know the psychology behind that. I mean, I guess, I guess there's a, there's a little bit of self deprecation that we all have. Um, so we don't want to be arrogant, but that's how I'd kind of think about that. So Rich, I want to switch gears really quick and, and, um, and talk to you about trust. I'm currently listening to your audio book. I wish I had time to read, but, um, but thankfully your book is an audio form. So yeah. if, if any, and if, if any of the alphas are into audiobooks like me, please check it out. So far, I'm completely over the moon about it. And according to the 430 other people who've uh, rated this on my particular uh, audiobooks platform, it's a five star rating. So, oh, very nice. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so my question about trust, I've heard you talk about it through some of your other interviews, through this book, through the Attributes website, um, and then you've even got this program for your team building um, that's called the Trust Fall Program. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate on the importance of trust in in a team? Why yeah. do you harp on it so much? Like, what? Why is it playing such an integral role? In yeah, your it's. Um, I'm glad you asked, and I, I think that there's a. Yeah. First of all, it buttresses every part of any any high performing team is trust. And 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 I actually exp I explored this a little bit because I was thinking about two terms we hear quite often with teams and organizations. That's trust and inspiration. And um and of course my buddy Simon he talks about inspiration quite a bit. He's prolific about inspiration. Um and I, and so it, it caused me to start thinking about okay what's how do these two relate? How do trust and inspiration relate? And and the way I I thought about it is I asked myself a question and I asked myself two questions. The first question was all right, if you had a team that was um, 
let's see, high, uh, high on inspir, uh, high on, or low on inspiration, but high on trust. Would that team survive? Low on inspiration and high on trust. Would that team survive? And when I ask myself that question, and I've asked audiences this question, the usually answer that I get is is yes. You would, the team would survive. Okay, um, but if you flip the question and say, okay, what if I had a team that was I said uh, high on trust, high on inspiration, but low on trust, right? Would that one survive? High on inspiration, low on trust. And most people will say, actually, no, that wouldn't survive. And so the way I like to say it is, or, or describe it is that um, you want to think of trust as the boat and inspiration as the wind, right? And so, you, of course, we want to, we always want to be, we want to be uh, sailing on the on the seas. And I'm a Navy guy, so I use sailing, but sailing on the seas um, and the wind's in our hair and we go on a nice clip, right? But sometimes the wind dies down. Sometimes we're in the doldrums. Sometimes the storm rolls in. And if we don't have that boat, we're sinking. Um, and I will say that most of us can agree. Um, in fact, all of us here and most of our listeners could agree that sometimes the military mission is decidedly uninspirational, right? But the way we always got through it was through trust, right? Because we had the trust built, right? We had that boat built. And so, so we have to work on that boat. Optimally, we have both, right? But the good news is a trusted team and a trusted relationship can be in of itself a source of inspiration. And so that's why it's such an elemental uh, uh, function of, of, um, of team building. And what we also have to recognize is trust is not um, a feeling. It's not just a human emotion. It's a human emotion that's been rationalized, right? So in other words, it's a belief. So we, we form a belief of trust. Any belief requires a decision, by the way, which tells us something very simple. And that is you cannot make anybody trust you. You can't do it. All you can do is behave in a way that allows them to make a decision to trust you, right? which tells us, okay, the only way I can build trust is to behave in a way that allows someone to choose to trust me, all right? It's, it's not this whole thing, like you hear people like, well, I'll, 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 uh, I'll trust them when they prove it to me, right? No, now that's, not, that, that's backwards, right? We as leaders, especially because we go first, right? And, and behavior at least, right? We have to go first with that behavior so that they trust us and then hopefully it's reciprocal. Um, but team building is about, and that takes vulnerability, by the way. That's why that's why vulnerability is so important. But but it has to be that very elemental equation. It's kind of that 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 baseline that every it's that boat that we that that we build the entire uh, platform on. As a Navy guy, I absolutely as a corpsman, I, I I understood both your reference. I like the boats, but also that trust between corpsmen and the Marines is what makes us so successful at what we do as as marines and corpsmen uh yeah. is, is knowing that if they do something dumb i'm going to go get them and if i have to do something dumb to go get them somebody else is going to do something dumb to come get me yeah and yeah. and and it's evidence-based just like you yeah. said i love that yeah I, I think for me you know I, I was an apache pilot so you're literally trusting your life you know to your co-pilot like every time you get in the aircraft and you know you earn that like over over time uh, through hardship, through validation, through, you know, flight school and, and training. I'm sure it's the same in, in the SEALs team and, you know, in, in dev crew when it gets, you know, more, more intense. Um, but then, you know, I did find that, um, like transitioning into like corporate consulting, like it, it was harder to gain the, the trust of your, of your clients or mm -hmm. the, the trust of your, you know, con consulting team members, because, you know, I, I wanted to go in there and be like, uh, hey, you know, we're we're part of the team. I literally, I will trust my life to you in this boardroom. And uh, and then you realize like maybe their motivator motivators and intentions might be slightly different, and also like different uh, values uh, as well. And so, you know, how do you create the environment and conditions for people to be vulnerable? Like, do you feel that by creating some kind of uh hardship you know or some kind of shared struggle um like because that's what i found i found like through that you can really find out who somebody is how they're going to show up and did their actions actually back up their words yeah i mean so so I'll, i'm going to take the shared struggle i'll just put that on the on the on the shelf for a second because i want to get to it i think it's really important um to to answer the kind of the, the holistic part of the question, I mean, trust is, and the way we talk about trust is it's four elements, okay? Competence, consistency, character, and compassion. So in other words, uh, do the thing right, do the thing right over time, do the right thing, and do the right thing for me because you care about me as a human being, okay? Now, those four elements, 
you can start building trusting relationships inside of any one of those based on your behavior. Okay. It's only when you have all four though, that you have the longest lasting, most durable, mm. and most deep trust. A lot of times we in the military or in any business, right. You know, um, a lot of the trust is built on confidence, you know, in the Apache, you have to, a lot of the trust is built on confidence and the seals, a lot of this trust is built on confidence, but, but the, the long lasting durable trust, adds into it the consistency and adds into it the character and adds into it the compassion, right? And that's where you get the longest lasting kind of, um, uh, again, most durable trust. Because when you have all four elements, if one takes a hit, you have other ones to to, to fall back on. So now when it comes to um, shared diversity, shared experience, right? Uh, shared um, shared intensity, right? This is when the 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 trust equation, the trust bond can actually happen faster. Um, and mm. it's because you think about it. I mean, just, I mean, uh, you, you, you could, you could have an accident on the highway. Some stranger comes and pulls you out of the car and saves you. And suddenly you trust that person forever. Right. And that's because that person yeah. showed competence, consistency, compassion, and character all in one moment. And, and Oh, by the way, neurologically, this makes sense. I just, I'm a neuroscience geek, even though I'm not one. Right. But I love hanging with them. And my son wants to be one, which I'm really pleased about, but, but what happens in our brain is, um, so a good friend of mine, his name is Andrew Huberman. He's a, he has a podcast called the Huberman Lab, and he and I are good friends. And I remember he and I talking about this once, and, and we were talking about the fact that um, uh, when, when, we, when we learn something, we create a neural connection in our brain. Our brain, our brain connects to, to neural networks, right? Um, and what happens when you do that is as you do it over and over again, you myelinate that connection. And myelin is, is, a, is a substance that's kind of like the, 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 the plastic on coaxial cable, right? And 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 as the as the connection myelinates, that that the speed with which that that uh, that that energy flows goes faster and faster. So this is like when you first start driving a stick shift car, you just make that connection, and you're you have to think about it a lot, right? But as you do it over and over again, it myelinates. You begin to be able to do it without thinking. Okay. Well, all this to say that the the they've they've proven in science that the the fastest way to create a connection and myelinate it. And we're talking about like 10 to 20 to 50 times faster is when three things are present in an environment. Those three things are intensity, novelty, and focus, right? So if you have intensity, novelty, and focus, those three things being present my, uh, creates a network and myelinates it. So think about it. This is why we learn more from mistakes and bad stuff than we do good stuff. Because every time something bad happens, where uh, it's 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 really intense. Mm -hmm. It's usually pretty novel, and there's a ton of focus involved, right? There's also why, in a simpler sense, we still remember the alphabet song because there's intensity, novelty, and focus in that, right? So, or the song of you know the, the lyrics of our favorite music, right? But um, but the idea is 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 environment can uh can accelerate the process. It has to be a genuine though. I mean, if it's if it's if it's ingenuine or, or or inauthentic or in terms or or almost it see if it seems engineered, it's not going to work as well. Um, but it's why people who go through shared experience build that trust faster. Pretty pretty interesting. Yeah. And I'm wondering I'm wondering how um, let's say we've got legion posts across the U.S. and they all have internal leadership. So these are teams and they're all, you know, the goal is to give back to their communities, the veteran community, each and every one of them have what drives them within their own communities. So I guess my question is for the alphas out there who are listening, how can they take back this sort of the, the attributes to their legions? How can they apply this? How can they work with you to improve their team, um, their team operations and success stories within their own posts? Yeah, I think um, I mean so. First is a is a, a willingness to 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 look deeply at what you got going on, right? And what and what are those? And 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 I would say dive into the content because here's the cool thing, and and you all are experiencing this because you've read the book and you're kind of into it. Is I kind of call it the blessing and the curse of attributes. Once you see them, once you see attributes, you can't unsee them. You start seeing them everywhere, right? And it's a it's a you you inculcate a new language of performance. So the, if the first thing is just start to learn the language, um, if there is if there's work that they're interested in doing in terms of figuring out their team dynamics, then we can certainly help them with that. And, and we could say, okay, how can you kind of bring together? Um, and then also look at their own, the, the way they, the way they lead. I mean, I talk about the leadership attributes and the leadership attributes are again, being a leader, being in charge, two separate things, right? We don't get to, and we don't get to self-designate. We don't have to, to call ourselves leaders, right? You know, that's like calling yourself good looking or funny, right? Other people decide whether or not you are someone they want to follow. I was an, I was an officer in the, in the Navy for 21 years, I was always in charge of something. Yeah, whether or not I was a leader depended on what people thought of me who were in my span of care. 
Um, and so, so we have to start recognizing that, that it's all about these behaviors. It's all about these attributes. If we want to be a leader, then behave like one. Um, uh, and then that will start to, that will start to model the behavior you want to see more of in your team or organization. So there's several ways folks can kind of, kind of, kind of, uh, work on their own, their own environment. So they can do some, some self, uh, introspection, self kind of discovery, um, they can listen to the book um, or read the book, um, or they can come, you know, ask us and, and we can look at work, work with them and help them put together some of those pieces, which which in some cases ha lets it happen a little bit faster since we since we know what we're doing. <laughs> I, I like well, the, you know, once you know it, you you can't unsee it. It's Pandora's self-reflection. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, quick that's thing, right. Stacey, I just want to mention um, uh, I, you know, they asked me when I wrote the book, if I wanted to read the book, you know, uh, the audio version. And I, I felt like I, I always I always feel like when I don't have the author reading it, it's a little disingenuous. So I said to myself, well, I'm mm -hmm. definitely going to read this. I said, unless you could get Morgan Freeman, then I'll, <laughs> I'll read it. Right. But um, uh, David but it Attenborough, was, <laughs> yeah, but it was uh, harder than I thought. Uh, it took yeah. about four days in the studio and reading my own words. I was at, at some points cursing myself for stringing certain words together in a sentence because I was like, mm -hmm. why the heck did I put these words together? So so it was harder I than I thought. Did, but... I think you did great for what it's worth. You did great. It is well, an you. art. You know, Their reading is hard. It's it was only work. it was only several takes on some of those, but the... <laughs> no, so it's and got I, a great face you... to be a narrator. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I appreciate it that you read it because I think that that you're right. I think there's something more um, genuine and authentic when it comes from the author's voice. So I, I love hearing it from from your perspective, and it's been wonderful um, hearing and chatting with you today. Uh, taking your voice from my phone onto onto the podcast. Yeah, it, it really has, Rich. We really appreciate the the time you spent with us today. Uh, before you sign off, though, is there anything else that you want to share uh, with our listeners that we didn't get a chance to discuss yet? I don't think so. I think uh, I think check us out at theattributes.com. It's a really easy website. I am currently in the middle of writing the second book. I'm hoping to have that out by fall. The second book is called Masters of Uncertainty, um, and it's a step by step guide for people to become what I define the Navy SEALs and most military units as. It's not about the shooting or the skydiving or the scuba diving. It's the fact that we are individuals and teams that can drop into complex environments and perform optimally. And there are certain things we need to know, there are certain steps we can take. So, so the new one combines some neuroscience and some neuroscientific steps that you can take with yourself physiologically and mentally, as well as some things you need to know about yourself. Uh, attributes, obviously, is one of those things. Um, so, uh, so if you if you sign up for the newsletter or or get on our get in our system, we'll, you'll you'll kind of get heads up on when that stuff comes up. Well, you'll I just want to say the manuscript you're... so that we can have you back back on <laughs> yeah. in in the fall. Yeah, we'll we'll do we'll do. You're you're a good looking. You're a leader. I just want to tell you that because you may not know it. We do appreciate having you so much. Well, thanks, Joe. Thanks for stopping it too, or else I would have I would have felt like it was disingenuous. So yeah, two compliments. Yeah, I didn't want to it. <laughs> don't, don't he overstep. is a good listener, folks. He is a good he is a Marine, but he's a good listener. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. I appreciate it. It's great to be with all of you. And and it's great to be part of this community. Uh, so I want to just say thank you. I you know, I, I say thank you to all of you, my brothers and sisters, for for everything we all did together. And 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 it's it was an honor, even though we we may not have crossed paths overseas, it's always an honor to to have served with with all of you. So thanks for that. Rich, thank you so much for visiting us today. And Alphas, well, stick around and uh, we're gonna have some scuttlebutt coming your way after the break. The American Legion is raising awareness about PTSD and veteran suicide by offering hope, camaraderie, and support. Be the one to help end veteran suicide. Be the one to save one veteran. Be the one to ask a veteran in your life how they're doing. Be the one to reach out when a veteran is struggling. Go to be the one.org and help the American Legion end veteran suicide. Will you be the one? Okay, Alphas, we hope you had a good break. Now it's time for some scuttlebutt. Oh, yeah, Adam, get this. So uh, for anybody who's ever been stationed overseas, you know when voting season comes around, it is a pain in the you-know-what. Uh, you've got a scuttlebutt. It's, it's a pain in your scuttlebutt. Yes, because you have to get your absentee ballot if you can actually get it. And who knows if your ballot ever ever really matters? Like, does it make it there on time? Not likely. Well, the good thing is DARPA, D-A-R-P-A, -A, uh, is working with a contractor uh, called Voting Works. And they are spending about $6.8 million to research uh, the development and technology 
that will change how deployed uh, service members and those who are stationed abroad uh, elect their officials during election season. And um, for those who are deployed overseas who vote, they must email the absentee ballots uh, that generally don't get counted, uh, at least not until the auditing period, and usually uh, only after the projected winners already win. So they're trying to get a little out in front of that. Anyway, so right now, the way it stands, it creates a perception that translates basically to voter participation. According to VoterWorks, military voters are turning out at a rate of about 47% compared to 74% of their civilian counterparts. Most military members, like I was just kind of ranting about, who want to vote but did not often cite challenges about requesting absentee ballots. Uh, they don't arrive on time. They don't actually get them when they're requested. It's a whole complicated mess. By the voting works process, they're going to create a portable voting station that's compact enough to fit into a suitcase and that would permit folks to uh, print paper ballots that match local election ballots and to generate uh, a mailing list, a mailing label rather, uh, that will go on that ballot, go to the correct polling center and will be uh, ready for voting on election night. That, that changes everything. And it's encrypted. So for all you, um, you know, tinfoil hatters out there, there's nothing really to worry about. It's going to be totally legit. Um, immediately transmitted to the election center for counting. And these paper versions will follow on in the mail, allowing the hard copy to be verified once the audit uh, window is opened up. So uh, what do you guys think? Have you ever uh, voted absentee while deployed or overseas? Uh, I've never voted absentee. And I know they're trying to make this process more simple, you know, and accessible. But do we really need to print things like still? I think, I mean, I think that's the question. Like, shouldn't we be able to create a process that's like secure, that's encrypted, maybe it's on the blockchain and be able, I, like, I, I know that there's probably people working on this. So I would say kudos to them for trying to make a better process, but do I really need the paper receipt? Like, I don't need the proof that I bought a donut. I'm just going to go look in my bank. Android texting is literally more secure than our ballot system. I mean, I've, I would I, I would almost be happier with what the, a paper ballot that I give someone that goes in a cardboard box and then goes on a truck where, you know, like you said, who knows where that stuff is. Uh, and, and yeah, I'm I'm glad to see something going. But I, you know, I, I feel like there's you have to do step one before you do step two. I'm interested to see where this goes. Definitely a step in the right direction. Agreed. Anything that can that can incentivize people to get out there and cast their vote because that's our civic duty. You know, those who are serving in their uniform in the uniform know what it's like to, uh, to have service and sacrifice and voting is part of that, uh, civic duty. So you've had it here, folks. I think I'm uh, Joe, you've got something up for us. Don't you? I do. So buckets and pockets, sailors with chilly fingers, listen up. This is big news. The U S Navy has issued uniform policy updates in February when state quote, Sailors are authorized to have hands in their pockets when doing so does not compromise safety nor prohibit the proper rendering of honors and courtesies. Now, I want to add that this won't change the behavior of any sailors out there, but at least they'll stop getting in trouble for it. I was going to say, so, don't they already use their pockets? It, they do. And there's just something about that. The You know, you put on that white hat and the thing flares out and you just feel so cool and you want to put your hands in your pockets and smoke a uh you know virginia slim i don't know i don't smoke whatever <laughs> so so there what were, do you guys think about that well what when we were out on the the flight line and the rotors are turning and it's really cold you put your hands in your pocket and then the crew chief comes up and they always said us you know this is a, a sailor regulation but said uh hey sir you need to take your air force gloves off so i know i I thought this was a an air. So this is a Navy thing. Um, but it's funny. I like the uh, sailors are authorized to have hands in their pockets when doing so does not compromise safety nor prohibit the proper rendering of honors and courtesies. <laughs> like that's how you use a pocket. Like yeah. they define normal pocket use and when you should and shouldn't. And they did and it like so, so like perfectly. So I like, I think this is great and it's common sense. I'm trying to think committee. of all the scenarios when your hands are in your pockets that would be unsafe. 
you know, I'm going to drive my vehicle, not permit, you know, put hands in pocket. I'm going climbing. to, no, no, or like, <laughs> I'm going to wave off an airplane without my hands. I mean, it seems pretty <laughs> straightforward. Why yeah, does they, the they, army they, have the such signal a hang guys up? are the ones that are really getting hosed oh, here. They, they, yeah. they have, they can't do anything. Adam, why about, does the army have such a hang up about pockets? Oh, I thought you said, why does the Army have such a hang-up about the Air Force? And I was going to say, it, it's because you took our fixed-wing aircraft. Oh, well, you know, we just fly them <laughs> better. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. I'm not getting involved. Uh, about Air Force, I don't know. Just, it's the sibling rivalry thing. Well. We, we do have a good eclectic mix, though. I mean, you know, I think it, with, with stuff like this, you know, we've got the Air Force, the Navy that serve with the Marines, and then, you know, the Army. We, uh, you know, if, if, if you'll go into the Coast Guard, and the Space Force, you, you guys will have the rest of it covered, too. Can you put your hands in your pockets in outer space? I, I don't know. Can anyone hear you get I don't know at? if a spacesuit comes with pockets. We'll have to ask. NASA, oh, the, mm, NASA yeah. drop us a line, please. Let us right, know. So at, at the, the rest of it is a uh, other notable changes mostly affect female sailors. The female combination cover, a.k.a. the bucket cover, came out of retirement. Women can wear it with service dress or dinner dress. Alternatively, if wearing dinner dress or white jacket uniforms, they can choose the, ti the tiara. And who really what? doesn't love a tiara? What the hell? This does not. That's what I'm like. I, you know I didn't what? know Princess that existed. game is strong. Yeah, but the tiara game, you got to admit, you see somebody in a tiara, you, you change your attitude towards that person in one way or another. Um, I'm, I'm going to call the, I'm going to call flag on that play. I don't. A tiara does not feel uh, legit. Tiara or tiara? Can you do that during PT? Is it tomato or tomato? <laughs> tiara, tiara. Tiara, tiara. I'm going to stop They're saying tomato, ridiculous. tomato. I love that. Tiara, tiara. But uh, <laughs> when it's PT time, sailors may now wear leggings and T-shirts designed for women. Last but not least, you may now wear false eyelashes or eyelash extensions while in uniform. Oh, my that, gosh. That Have is notable. Seen... But look, look at these eyelashes. I got no, like no, nothing. No, seriously. These falsies though, they're kind of a thing and they're not just like something to enhance your eyelashes. Oh, yeah. It's it's like the long jump of competitions of really? like who can have the longest lashes. I bet. I wonder if the Navy, you know, they they put this or they, you know, they lifted the ban on eye falsies. What what kind of parameters are the limits? Like you know, the men's haircut mm. had to be tapered. Like yeah, a certain that's right. measurement. Is there a measurement? Yeah, there's got to be because I've seen eyelash. some that are just. I, I don't even know how they stay on. I know. Yeah, I don't know how they in the away. wind. I think when my eyelashes blow in the wind, that's my hard line to say I've gone too far. We've you know <laughs> we were so busy asking whether or not we could, we never stopped to. to oh, Joe, take your tiara or not, off. All right. <laughs> I got to cover up this hairline somehow. But anyway, that's uh, that's a scuttlebutt on that. And uh, so if anybody has any other questions, we do have a link to the Navy Times article. And I think we've got uh, something else on the on the docket here with uh, with Mr. Adam. Have you ever wondered how to name a helicopter? Um, Apache, <laughs> Lakota, <laughs> Apache, Chinook, Apache, Iroquois. Or I Apache. Feel redundancy happening. Oh, there. sorry. It's an. How do you know? <laughs> not uh, how, how do you know he's Apache pilot? He'll tell you. Uh, the names of Native American tribes that once fought for their land against the U.S. military, and the names of U.S. Army helicopters. The convention of naming choppers after America's indigenous people is believed to date back to 1947. Army General Hamilton Howes reportedly wasn't thrilled with hoverfly and dragonfly. Although I think those are kind of catchy. Oh, the names no. of the first two army helicopters, hoverfly and dragonfly, and ordered some changes. He wanted to name them after something that was fast moving, military strong, and had some kind of connection to the American military history, said David Silby, a military historian at Cornell University. And he thought of the Native American warriors of the 19th century the Apache, the Lakota, and all those folks. And so he started the tradition of naming Army helicopters after Native American tribes. An Army regulation created in 1969 codified this naming protocol 
Naming suggestions were to be provided by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Sylvie says required naming regulations no longer exist, but certain military naming traditions have continued. For example, the Lakota helicopter was named as recently as 2012 in honor of the Lakota tribe of the Great Sioux Nation in North and South Dakota. Woo-hoo. That same year, Lakota elders blessed two Lakota choppers at the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota. This article goes on to talk about naming conventions for other military craft, some of which were more questionable, such as the World War II era ships designed to carry ammunition and explosives. Many of the ships in this class were named after volcanoes, and one of the vessels exploded in 1944, killing about 400 people. The article ends mentioning that the Space Force has yet to begin naming their equipment. What sort of naming convention should they adopt? What do you think, Alphys? All, All right. right. Well, what what do we think about the the Native uh, uh, American uh, uh, process for for naming aircraft? I love it. I I I, I always I think whenever you take something um, and do it with with honor and with love like that, I mean these are named after warriors. Like you know, when it comes to American warriors, that's where it started. Um, for better for worse, you know, you have to acknowledge that these people were just incredible, wonderful. Um, and so I had a, a dear friend of mine um, that, that we lost that was uh, from the Navajo tribe, the Bitterwater tribe. So I, I think if I was going to name a helicopter, I, I like a Bitterwater, probably a boat, be a better boat name. But I, hey, I'm all for it. Mm. And for that, uh, the recent name of Lakota, being a, a South Dakotan, definitely got to mm. give some props to the Lakota folks out there. And, you know, I, I think of it like this. Uh, is I mean, as Joe already stated very eloquently, if it's done out of love and respect, that's fine. And so long as the um the names' sake are, you know, okay with it, I think it's pretty badass. Um, yeah. You know, when when mm. it becomes a one sided affair, then that's a problem. But it sounds to me pretty good. Um, and I. I feel like the one that was named after the volcano was sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. So I think as the Space Force begins to look at what their naming scheme is going to be, they should be really, really careful. Uh, you know, you don't want to be like Starburst, like all your favorite, all your favorite fruit candies that bl- explode in your mouth. Pop rocks. You know, gotta be careful. And 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 also, you know, it's like it didn't both Titanics, didn't they make a Titanic two or something and it sank as well? Like I feel like it's just you gotta be careful. Names have power. Um oh, and, they, they, yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I have a oh, side no, note. I, I was so if it's on you. topic, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is on topic. Uh okay. no, I mean the, the the names are are uh powerful and they have meaning and and so does, you know, the the spoken word. Um at one point, we moved from the Apache AH-64 Delta model, and then we upgraded to the Apache AH-64 Echo model. So it, it, there were so many enhancements to the aircraft. Um, they were retrofitting some of them, but then there were also new builds as well. So they actually did a, a ceremony um, with with the a, a Apache um, tribe, and so Boeing went out and did this. And to your point, Stacey, um, it, it was a, a, a joint endeavor. And so being able to bring some of the, the ceremonial um, rites uh, in, into that and do it in a really um, thoughtful um, and beautiful way um, to to really give honor, you know, and credit to, to those warriors. And then I think, you know, to your point, you know, Joe, um, yeah, there's such a troubled history between the military and indigenous um, and Native Americans. And I think that that that's changing. And, uh, you know, I, I myself have had the opportunity to work with Native American elders and, and did a joint fundraiser um, with them in, uh, in 2022. And I think the last thing I'll say, the most incredible thing about that ceremony was it wasn't about them coming and telling all the things that the military had done wrong. It was about them coming and partnering with nonprofit veteran organizations so we could heal and move forward together. And so I, th- I think that's the the beautiful part about it. And um, yeah, these these names mean, mean a lot to me, um, having uh, you know over 1,500 hours in, in Apache aircraft, like flying an Apache in combat in, in Iraq. And, and I feel that tie um, to those people. So it's it's a beautiful thing to me. 
there's a lot of reverence, I think, between military members and, and Native Americans. I think that um, there's, you know, uh, uh, there's always love there. Uh, my question, however, was, um, Adam, if you have both flown an Apache helicopter and did CrossFit, what would you tell people about first? <laughs> well, why would I do CrossFit? I'm joking. Oh, That's not going to involve me curling in front of the mirror. No. <laughs> no. Oh, there you go. I don't know if you heard it. I did well over a thousand of them. No, man, I'm into calisthenics now. Just body weight exercises only. I got to maintain my spine. Oh, nice. Well, you guys so, need to get fit because the Air Force is calling for new recruits. You guys drop it. Oh, yeah. Out. We got to get back in our uniforms. That's right. My back hurts. I need a Motrin first. All right, Alphas, thank you so much for listening. You can subscribe to our podcast, our newsletter, or send us mail and guest recommendations at legion.org backslash Tango Alpha Lima. And we'll see you next week.